Good afternoon. This is the Board of County Commissioners Board of Work Session. It is Monday, July 31st, 2023. It is 3.07 p.m. This session is set to go until 4 p.m. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting. We're at 3000 Pacific Avenue Southeast, room 110 for public virtual attendance. You may follow along on the Thurston County YouTube channel. I'm Carolina Mejia. I'm the chair of the board. To my right is Vice Chair Ty Menser. To my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards. And today we're having a briefing on the meat processing study, meat processing study briefing. Um, and so pass it to Jenica and then we can do introductions of everyone in the room. Sure, uh, Jenica Machado, Economic Development Manager in Pearson County. Hello, I'm Mike Poteet. I'm with Pierce County's Department of Planning and Public Works in the Long Range Planning Division. I'm the Senior Agricultural Agricultural Planner for Pierce County. And an Olympia resident. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Aslan Mead with the Thurston Economic Development Council. Stephen Bramwell, Washington State University Extension Director. Hi, I'm Robin Campbell. I'm the Assistant County Manager for Thurston County. Rob Gilder, the other Assistant County Manager. Uh, Romero Chavez, County Manager. Maybe we can go to Zoom now. I'm Angie Silva with uh, Pierce County Planning and Public Works, Long Range Planning Manager and support of Mike Boutique. Hi, I'm Catherine Murdoch, a Senior Communications Specialist with Mall Foster and Alonji, and we've been supporting both Pierce and Thurston County on the meat processing study. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Johnston. I'm staff planner with Mall Foster and Alonji, and um, I'll be talking about the meat processing study as well. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Uh, so this this uh, report has been a bit in the making, uh, but recognizing that this was a regional issue, Thurston County partnered with Pierce County uh, to take a regional approach in assessing the meat processing and slaughter um, labor force and infrastructure. And largely, I'll pass that over to Mike. Mike has been uh, the main manager of this contract and of this project, and so he'll be able to lead us forward in um, looking at the findings of the report. Okay, thank you, Jenica. I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for your time today. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and discuss this project with you all. Uh, we do have a slide deck that we'll be going through today, so hopefully it displays behind me. Um, I do have some notes that I'll be using, so please excuse some of the uh, lack of eye contact from time to time. And I will be handing over to my partners from uh, MFA uh, for their sections of the presentation. So, um, Again, thanks for everybody uh, being here in attendance today, including the interested parties that have arrived. Um, I work closely with farms in Pierce County, uh, issues related to permitting, land use, conservation, drainage policy. And as part of that broad role serving the agricultural sector in the county, uh, our division of uh, planning and public works was tasked with this um, assignment to evaluate regional agricultural meat production and processing infrastructure and labor capacity needs. That was part of our 2022-23 budget. Uh, there was a small proviso uh, allocated for this. We couldn't do very much with that very small amount of money, $35,000 allocated to us. And through um, uh, a lot of work between uh, Chair Mejia and Council Member Marty Campbell with the Pierce County Council, uh, uh, Discussion was begun and we were able to come up with a funding agreement wherein Thurston County matched the $35,000 that Pierce County had allocated. When that happened, it allowed us to go out and bring in an external consultant to actually conduct the study uh, due to workload issues and other things that typically we get bogged down with. So um, we brought in MFA. It's a consulting service firm based in Vancouver, Washington. They do provide work for regional governments all throughout the region. Uh, so they may not be unfamiliar to you. Uh, we have two of them with us today as we've already introduced themselves. Uh, so we're going to just bypass the introductions. That was going to be part of <laughs> this discussion. Um, so the final report from MFA uh, co-authored by them and, and our team was submitted just last week. Um, we've been trying to get it out and available. Uh, I believe you guys have copies here. We're issuing copies to our county council this week as well. Um, and the materials that are going to be presented today are taken straight from the report. Uh, the report obviously goes into a little bit more detail than what I will today. So the regional evaluation is really important. Um, 
This is not something that just Pierce County Farms are facing and just Thurston County Farms are facing. It's a nationwide issue. And so we really wanted to take an approach that didn't just stop at the boundaries and say, well, the competition of our farm here in Pierce County with the competition of a farm in Thurston County, that, that matters when you're looking at this industry. Uh, they're all competing for a very limited set of services. And COVID-19 took what was already kind of a tenuous uh, marketplace for these farms and kind of blew it up. Uh, everybody realized how, how fragile this, uh, this economic supply chain was. Um, and so what we heard, uh, you know, what was very vocal was these labor shortages, and that was very much a national issue. We, we heard about all the large processing facilities that uh, were having a hard time keeping up. We all experienced the sticker shock on meat prices. Um, and so when that all was going on, our county council thought, you know, we're hearing it from our farms, we're hearing it from our consumers, let's try to understand better what's going on uh, in this marketplace. And so because we have all this competition uh, regionally between farms, we thought it was really important to do this on a regional evaluation. Um, I started the project in 2022 on my own, just internally in Pierce County before we had a started uh, the, this mutual partnership. And we got some data together and it helped us kind of uh, clarify the questions that we wanted to ask of farms and understand what some of the variables we're going to need to address as we talk through this problem. Um, so the, the image on the screen here basically just shows the project area where we really tried to focus in. It's very much central South Puget Sound. Uh, we had to go a little north because our Pierce County farms compete with farms to the north. We had to come south because our Thurston County farms compete with farms to the south. So we got a pretty big geography in here. Um, the, the red outline indicates what our targeted study area was. Uh, the two sponsor counties are hashed. And uh, the dark blue represents places where we've had direct engagement with producers and processors. And the light blue is where we've collected other available information. So that's what uh, signified there. Next slide, please. So a little more background here. Um, this is, we don't want to get too far into the weeds in some of this conversation, but Basically, there are two options for farms on how they're going to get their meat processed. There's either USDA inspected, uh, you know, go to the butcher shop, go to the restaurant, go to the grocery store, what we're all used to seeing with the sticker on our meat whenever we go to the grocery store. And then there's the WSDA uh, custom exempt approach, which is where a farm has to sell the entire animal, either whole, half, quarter, eighth, whatever it might be, before it can be slaughtered, okay? There's not the full um, inspection process that they have to go through. Um, and so a farm is responsible for all of the marketing that has to take place. They have to find buyers. If they can only sell a quarter of a cow, they have to sell those other three quarters before they can take it and get it slaughtered. So there's a lot of, a lot of onus on the farm to try to sell those animals if they're going through the WSDA custom exempt process. And they cannot get uh, an animal scheduled for slaughter until they have evidence of the sales. Uh, typically, those slaughter operations happen uh, on farm, but there are some processing facilities that allow for slaughtering to take place there. Um, those are the two primary ways. And, and so you have a customer going and collecting their quarter of a cow from a processing facility, or you're going and you're buying from uh, directly from a, a retail outlet. And all this is outlined in the study with a little bit more clarity, especially I believe in Appendix A, it kind of shows a, a graphic of how it works. There is a third way to get meat if you're a, a, a consumer, uh, and that's with um, the retail meat exemption through USDA. We're not gonna go into that. It's discussed a little bit more in the report, but it kind of clouds the picture here when we're talking about WSDA and USDA and what those paths look like. So for the sake of today's presentation, when we say WSDA, we mean selling the whole animal and then individual uh, owners go and retrieve their, their meat. On USDA, it's going through the fully licensed certified facilities and then you're buying it in a retail atmosphere. So just wanted to clarify, WSDA, USDA, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so next slide, please. And I believe this is where I will hand it over to Catherine. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the approach, how we went about this market study. I'll dive a little bit more into the engagement approach and then um, we'll go straight to findings and what we found. So uh, 
the approach to this study began before we were on board in 2022 um, with more of a local focus on Pierce County to really test survey methods and identify important variables. Um, the local forms local farms in Pierce County and those partners were really helpful in refining questions and helping us really get to a lot of the engagement that we did in 2023. So then in January 2023, that was when we were brought on board to do a kickoff meeting and then launch into an engagement process, which as I mentioned, I'll go into in a little bit, um, do some industry and policy research, um, some GIS analysis, to look into where there might be some gaps um, in the region. Um, and then that resulted in findings in June um, of 2023 and then recommendations. So in the following slides, we'll go through all of these steps. Next slide. So the engagement process really built on that past engagement um, that I mentioned in 2022 with Pierce County um, which they had done a 2022 survey of producers and landowners. It also built on some other past engagement um, about producer barriers and constraints by the Washington State Department of Agriculture through their 2022 statewide producer survey. And then also Washington State University um, did a uh, survey of the peninsula in 2019. So there was a lot of great surveying done before we were brought on board and we really just tried to build on that. Um, to gain new insights um, with this study. There are more details also about all of that in the appendix of the report. So as I noted in the previous um, in the previous diagram that we looked at, the approach diagram, the engagement really began with inviting 14 of our regional partners to project kickoff. Now, not all of our regional partners were able to attend, but they were really key in helping us to get the word out about engagement and engaging farms. Following that virtual kickoff meeting, Pierce and Thurston counties uh, surveyed 67 regional producers uh, in mid-March 2023 on um, factors such as flock size, slaughter dates and counts, how far producers were willing to transport, what processing and slaughtering services producers used, and then barriers and solutions. Following the completion of that producer survey, producers were then invited to attend two different virtual 90-minute focus group sessions to really dive a bit deeper, um, and that was in April. And then following that, um, we did a survey of processors and slaughterers um, also in March. Given the time constraints for this group, um, Pierce County primarily gathered data through follow-up one-on-one phone calls um, to the most frequently used uh, processors and slaughters named in the producer survey. And so that's how we got that data. Next slide, we'll be diving into findings here. So I'm gonna start with the producers. Um, what we found from the engagement with the producers, both from the surveys and the focus groups, is that um, the limited number of slaughter and processing facilities in Pearson Thurston counties was really frequently named as a top barrier for producers in both the survey and in the focus groups. The lack of slaughtering and processing facilities definitely has direct impacts to producers' abilities to manage their herd, their production capacity, and their opportunities to expand. Producers also talked about rising costs of slaughtering and processing services, which caused them to increase their sale prices and then diminished their ability to have a competitive advantage in the market. Many producers also noted that they are constrained by their available land and infrastructure, as well as equipment to manage that land and haul animals. And finally, there we also learned that there's a pretty wide range of experience and knowledge among producers. This education and experience gap often results in varying approaches to managing their herds, willingness to compromise with slaughter practices, and inequities in scheduling with the slaughtering and processing facilities. So we asked producers for ideas on solutions and also asked them for some ranking, which again, you can read a little bit more in depth in the report, but some that rose up to the top for folks um, were help with limited, um, needing help with the limited availability of services. So that is anything from supporting the creation of new slaughtering and processing facilities to helping slaughtering and processing facilities attain USDA status to supporting upgrades of those facilities. Others noted that it would help um, to have help with scheduling issues. That could be anything from a slaughtering and processing scheduling portal 
to mobile slaughter units at stationary location. And finally, others noted that it would help to have it, um, help with that experience and education gap, especially for new farmers. And so that's where we noted that education and outreach. A final note before I move on from the producers that we heard from more established farms is the importance of right-sizing the response to these issues. Um, they noted that throwing up new facilities all over the place will definitely weaken existing businesses and could lead to the collapse of more services. Um, it sometimes maybe feels counterintuitive to those who might believe that more facilities will fix a lot of these problems that we named, but those established farms noted that finding that equilibrium is really important um, in an approach to interfering in current market dynamics. Next slide. So then the slaughterers, what did we hear from the slaughterers about their barriers and proposed solutions? Um, we we heard about waste management from the slaughterers, that that was definitely um, a challenge for them. They also noted facility and equipment challenges. Um, they also noted um, that they had varying capacity um, within their um, within their ability to manage their work. Um, fuel and travel times was a big one um, because they have to often go from farm to farm. Um, and scheduling actually lines up right with that as well, um, because in traveling from farm to farm, if one farm cancels, then that can really impact their ability um, to get to be as efficient as possible within a day. And then, of course, if they have long travel times, that's not efficient as well. The proposed solutions that um, slaughters proposed to those barriers was equipment to increase capacity. So. Um, that really came from the more established businesses. And then there were a few newer businesses that we talked to and, and their proposed solution was really all about advertising um, to gain customers and help build their customer base. The one thing I will note with that advertising solution though, is that even the newer slaughtering businesses had already built their customers very quickly. So you can already see that there's definitely demand um, for those new businesses. Next slide. All right, finally, processor barriers. Um, so the processors noted that their barriers um, were a lack of adequate storage space that was identified definitely as a top barrier for expanding capacity, specifically a lack of cooler and freezer space to store carcasses after slaughter. Um, while waste management was not a challenge for all of the participants' businesses, it was identified as a challenge for some similar to the slaughters, um, and they did indicate as a challenge um, and limit listed permitting and inspection issues, a lack of rendering services and offsite disposal options as kind of their most important concerns associated with that waste management barrier. Um, most participants indicated that they are experiencing labor challenges um, that impact their ability to increase capacity. Um, their labor challenges were mostly having to do with access to apprentice programs, wages and benefits, and then retention um, and training new staff. Uh, participants also identified cost as a significant barrier to expanding their businesses, given the cost of equipment and cost of hiring and training employees. And then in both the 2022 Pierce County surveys and the 2023 surveys that we conducted, Processors noted capacity constraints that kept them from expanding their businesses and are processing more animals. So their proposed solutions was really focused on that cost piece, um, I think because it came up so often in their barriers. Um, and so they identified grants and loans that would be very helpful for them and then funding to expand their capacity, especially with that cold storage space. And with that, I will pass it along to Melissa, to talk about our industry and policy review findings. Thank you, Catherine. So for our policy review, we looked at the federal and state rules that producers and processors must follow and how these policies impact meat production and processing in our region. We looked for opportunities to increase use of the custom meat exemption and explored alternative ways of complying with federal policies. For example, one alternative is the State Meat and Poultry Inspection Program, and this allows states to enter a cooperative agreement with the USDA 
Under this agreement, meat that is processed at participating WSDA licensed facilities that enforce requirements at least equal to federal policies, uh, the meat can be sold in stores and restaurants within Washington state. And through a cooperative in interstate shipping program agreement with USDA, these products could be shipped out of state as well. Washington's not currently participating in these programs. Um, they were considered in a Senate bill in 2021, but found to be too expensive. We also looked at available grant funding from federal and state governments. The newest upcoming funds announced by the USDA are 100 million for processors to upgrade existing facilities and construct new facilities. And there's an additional 20 million in grant funds coming for research and development to help processors expand capacity through innovative practices and technologies. Even small grants yield big results in terms of increasing meat processing capacity in our region, whether they be from the federal or state grant funding sources. So last year, WSDA awarded $3.6 million to small meat processors. Uh, small project grants averaged about $50,000 per award, but together they yielded nearly $20 million annually for producers and processors in Washington. So small investments make a big difference. Here are a few examples of the positive impact of grant funding. So on the next slide, um, we'll share about Marzoff Meats in Snohomish, Washington. They're one of our grant recipient success stories that we include in the report. They received a $200,000 grant from USDA in 2022. This grant will help them increase their meat processing capacity. So with the funds, they'll upgrade their facility to offer USDA services, and they uh, were operating a custom slaughter facility, and they'll use the grant to upgrade their slaughter facility to USDA slaughter services and USDA cut and wrap services. Um, the funds will help them develop a new sales platform, which will better enable local buyers to obtain local meat. And they'll use their grant funds to develop a primal cut online sales platform to buy and sell locally produced meats to restaurants, grocery stores, and other butcher shops. So the grant not only benefits their business, but will also allow regional producers to grow their operations, knowing that they have a reliable market for their product. And these upgrades will give producers a new USDA slaughter and processing option that will allow them to pursue retail sales. Marzoff Meats is not quite up and running yet, but the um, improvements funded by the grant are currently underway. So on the next slide, I'll share one more grant success story. And this one is for a WSDA grant recipient. So a WSDA licensed processor in the region received two $75,000 grants, which helped them address their biggest constraint, a lack of storage space. And this lack of storage space had been leading them to turn customers away. So with these grants, they are able to double their cutting floor space, increase their holding areas for animals scheduled for slaughter, more than double their cold storage space, and they're now able to offer slaughter and processing services full-time year-round. So these improvements doubled their total operating capacity and improved their slaughter efficiency for the mobile slaughter businesses that they par partner with. Um, they have been able to put these funds to work and they are up and running. Okay, so on the next slide, I'll switch to the spatial analysis portion of the study. We developed a GIS knowledge base for this project. The knowledge base is a web mapping application that includes point locations for producers and processors, um, and it contains information about the services that they seek and offer. So this tool allows us to examine the spatial relationship between producers and processors and the impact that their location um, and relationship to each other has on meat processing capacity in the region. This tool will allow for ongoing data analysis by Pearson Thurston counties. And um, the two maps on the screen are from that knowledge base and these are used in the report. On the left, the map shows the producers that participated in this project survey as well as the 2022 survey. And they're color coded by the type of slaughter and processing services that they seek, USDA or WSDA. Then on the right, this map shows um, the slaughter and processing facilities in the region. We chose to include the facilities in proximity to I-5, um, plus a few USDA facilities outside the region because they provide services that are important to the producers inside the region. Um, and again, these slaughters and processors are color-coded by the type of service they offer. 
So these are the starting place for our spatial analysis. Um, on the next slide, um, this map, we're looking at the USDA slaughter and processing services available to our region. Producers located in the red circles, north of Pierce County and also um, south of Thurston County, they have two USDA options within a 100 mile drive. Producers in the yellow circle in the uh, core area of our region, they have just one USDA option within a 100 mile drive. And the USDA options are marked with those red stars. There's currently only three USDA licensed slaughter and processing facilities operating west of the Cascades. There's one more east of the Cascades, but this involves more than a 100 mile drive and crossing a mountain pass. So we can see from this map that there are long drives to USDA slaughter and processing services, which can lead to scheduling challenges. And the long drives can lead to more stress on the livestock. On the next slide, um, here are some suggested locations for new slaughter and process facilities, um, both USDA and WSDA. These recommended locations are informed by a drive shed analysis as shown on the maps there, um, stakeholder feedback, and also local knowledge about the convenience of these locations for the producers, like proximity to roads, retail stores that producers often visit and their general convenience. So the drive shed portion of the analysis is uh, based on the locations each producer can reach within 50 miles of driving using existing roadways. The yellow and orange sections on the map show where a new facility would serve 50 or more producers, all within a 50 mile drive. We um, recommended six general locations um, that were identified for new slaughter and processing facilities, three in Pierce County and three in Thurston County. The three locations recommended to choose from in Thurston County are Maytown and Tenino, where there is a proposed facility already being worked on, and Yelm. So given the GIS analysis, policy analysis, and public engagement findings, we then developed um, a set of recommendations. And Catherine will share those recommendations next. Thanks, Melissa. So I'll run over the recommendations at a high level, um, but we're of course happy to answer any questions that you have. So we have a set of recommendations that you can um, see in the report. Uh, the first recommendation is really about new facilities. I think it's likely not surprising given all the feedback we heard about the need for additional um, slaughtering and processing resources that we would need that recommendation around new facilities and that investment in additional USDA licensed and WSDA licensed facilities um, to help um, increase opportunities for producers to sell their meat products. Another recommendation we have is around state policy. Um, as Melissa noted in her um, summary of findings, the option exists for state legislation that creates a meat and poultry inspection program and cooperative interstate, interstate sales program um, to give producers more choices for slaughtering and processing services um, that lead to retail opportunities and can increase the sale of meats. So that is certainly something to look into. Um, and then increasing infrastructure through both state and federal grants. We heard that in the solutions um, during our engagement that um, cost is a big barrier for folks. And then of course, as Melissa shared, in the success stories, um, uh, grants can go a long way in supporting producers and processors um, and increasing their infrastructure. Um, then the next set of recommendations is really about partnering with the private sector to establish the slaughtering and processing scheduling portal and central service hubs. Um, so that scheduling portal is the idea is to create that portal to help producers, processors, and consumers region wide. Um, so that users can view and schedule time with slaughtering and processing services that helps new farmers um, better schedule and then also helps make sure that uh, slaughters and processors are not um, dealing as much with the cancellation issue that can impact their profit. The central service hubs could be something um, that is located in a centralized location. It could have stationary slaughtering and processing services um, or the ability to regularly accommodate um, mobile slaughtering units to reduce the distance that producers need to transport their livestock um, to both those USDA licensed and WSDA licensed um, services. The next set of recommendations is really about collaborating with local partners and nonprofits um, to establish mentorship programs and apprenticeship programs. So on the mentorship side, again, this is getting at the new farms 
um, helping them um, gain all the knowledge that they need to be successful. And then apprenticeship is really getting at that labor need that we heard um, about the need um, for that specialized training to get folks up and running um, to recruit and train new slaughtering and processing workers for career positions. And finally, um, partnering with WSCA or the WSCU Extension to really expand consumer demand and with WSCA inspected um, custom meat marketing. So really expanding that demand for custom meat and helping people understand um, how to buy directly from farmers and prepare unfamiliar cuts of meat so that it's easier for farmers to sell. Um, and then also partnering with WSDA or WSU Extension to expand consumer demand for buffalo and beefalo. Um, different slaughter and processing rules apply to these type of meats um, and they can be sold in stores and restaurants in Washington state when slaughtered and processed at a WSCA facility. So helping provide some technical assistance for producers interested in raising um, buffalo and beefalo and then supporting a marketing campaign to increase that demand um, could be useful as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike to uh, share next steps and wrap us up on the presentation. Yeah, so thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Melissa. We'll wrap this up. Um, so we've submitted the final report to, to you all last week, so you have it in your hands. Um, I, as county staff, I do have limited time in the coming weeks and months to continue discussing in more detail some of the findings in this report. We will not be expanding the work at this time. This is the completion of the project as assigned. Um, we do have plans to share the final report with partners at WSDA and their regional markets program who assisted us in this work, um, as well as uh, partners and businesses around the region that contributed in this work. And I have a full list of that uh, initial list of interested parties that I'm happy to share with you all, as I will be sharing with Pierce County's leadership uh, at the same time. So that's where we stand with this project. Uh, this is the conclusion of it. We have completed the contract with Mall Foster Alonji as of today. It is over. So um, I will be your primary point person for any future requests or information inquiries about this work. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer questions in the time we have left today. So thank okay. you. Thank you. OK, questions. Uh, we'll start with commissioners and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Has anything been looked into about uh, workforce grants or something to where we can get folks up and running as far as a little bit of expertise or whatever, so, whatever it takes? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Commissioner. And there are pro programs out there, specifically the Northwest Meat Processors, Meat Processors Association does have an apprenticeship program that they operate. They haven't had huge demand for it, and they've had difficulty finding partners for it. Um, you know, technical colleges, things of that nature would be ideal locations, but they don't necessarily have the facilities, and they haven't had the interest level to really justify some of the expenditures that are required to get the apprenticeship programs up and running. One of the biggest issues, and we kind of alluded to it in the, in the presentation here, is there's this nexus between training and apprentices and space. And there's a reluctancy on behalf of a lot of the processing facilities Side note, the labor issue is really more for the processors than for the slaughtering. It tends to be a more difficult thing to get that level of expertise up yeah. uh, to be qualified as a, as a true meat cutter to do the, the, the commercial cuts. Um, and so what you find in that world is most of the businesses can't handle more people because they don't have enough space. And so you get into this chicken and egg issue of, do I, I need more people so I can harvest it or so I can process more carcasses, but I don't have anywhere to put it. And then it links up into that scheduling issue where we don't have the capacity in our coolers because people aren't picking up their purchases quick enough. And so we have these inefficiencies that just kind of crop up and then they build on each other through the system. So it's, it's a little more complex than just are there programs out there and are they sourced and funded well enough? It's finding the places that need the support, which in our interviews with folks, the processing facility said, yeah, we're okay. We're okay on labor. We could use more if we had more space and they would use more. 
they, they think the demand is there, and they think the opportunities for growth for their businesses are there, but they don't see how to execute it with the resources they have available throughout the entire business. Do your upper end steakhouses have their own hanging area or something? Is it usually, is that the way they do business? Not, not locally. Uh, maybe in some parts of the country where there's <coughs> huge demand for large steakhouses. <laughs> It, it, it's a little bit more prevalent. Um, what you tend to find, and, and I'll use a, a, a regional example. I'm not going to name the entity, but there is a there's a whole sector, and we talk about this briefly in the report, of something called boxed meats. And that's sort of a colloquial term for this type of processing facility that takes um, carcasses that have been pre-broken down. And what that looks like is typically a very large ranch operation. Most of the time these are in eastern Washington, Montana, Idaho, California, Oregon. Um, they're four, ten times larger than most of our largest farms regionally. And so they're getting their animals slaughtered and pre-processed in USDA facilities. And then they get cuts boxed up. So they'll get a box of 80 pounds worth of pre-prepared cuts that then go to these boxed meat facilities, which are USDA uh, inspected and certified. And those staff then break it down into the refined meats that go into restaurants, go into butcher shops, go into some grocery store meat counters. Um, and so oftentimes what you're dealing with in that situation, Commissioner, is a local restaurant might say they have local meat, but really when they're saying local, they're using a very broad term for Northwestern or Pacific Coast, and they don't really mean within 50 miles. They mean within 300 miles. And so there, there's some marketing issues there as well whenever a restaurant says we have local steaks. That's not really 100% uh, the same definition of what we might think of as local. Uh, when the recommendation list, the second bullet is state policy, and I didn't really understand what that meant. Sure. Um, so in 2021, a Senate bill came forward. I, I cannot remember off the top of my head. I think it was 5353. Um, and it proposed to create a state inspection program that has to, according to the feds, has to meet or exceed their licensure, their certification demands. So this, a state has an opportunity, and there are, I may need to be corrected on this one, Melissa or Catherine, uh, there are 22 of those, is that right? Chime in if you have the number handy. Um, and what those states have done is they have. Uh, Oregon just added one in 2022. They just created theirs. So it's not unheard of regionally. Um, and what that does is it requires an, an entire fleet of state employees who are inspectors who go out and they spend time at each of these facilities, just like the USDA facilities do. Uh, the Senate bill was did not make it out of committee. Uh, it was viewed as too costly for the state to pursue. Um, I, full disclosure, I did brief uh, Representative Strickland's staff on this report about a month and a half ago as we were just kind of pulling together our final recommendations and findings. And I had to focus on USDA-centric issues when speaking with <laughs> anybody in that position because they don't care about WSDA issues. And um, I did just throw out the idea of states may be more willing to take on this burden if there was support in getting it off the ground. The real issue has to do with you know, that, that initial heavy lift of creating the structure, creating the staffing, getting everything figured out until you can come up with a better financing mechanism uh, as a state. But um, that's what it really is, is speaking to, Commissioner. Great, thank you. A second question was about the, um, the map of proposed locations. Mm -hmm. So how deep did that analysis go? Is it just like, okay, this would be great because of the, the driving everything, or, or were you actually looking at like, oh, there's zoning to support that, there's property for sale to support yeah. that, or what? Great question. This is not a feasibility study, okay? This was not a granular, let's look at the zoning, let's look at what current regs are in place in this different community or that. 
to determine what that would look like. Same situation for how we look at Pierce County. What I did do for Pierce County locations, which are in the report, they're not really in the presentation, was I happen to know where our farms go for other services. And so I looked at, well, you know, we have feed stores here, we have farm supply stores in this vicinity. It, uh, it's easily accessible by a large number of our ranch type uh, farm operations. So I was able to use kind of general knowledge about the geography of the area. For Thurston County, um, we did select something on the I-5 corridor. Uh, the I-5 corridor in Pierce County is not amenable because we have the base and then basically, uh, you know, dense, yeah, <laughs> very dense population and development. But uh, I did want to include something on the I-5 corridor, although if it were up to farms, they would never haul an animal on the freeway. Uh, the high speeds, the noise, the risk, it's just less, uh, less ideal for meat quality because that stress right up before slaughter can actually impact meat quality quite a bit. So they would prefer to stay on smaller roads, uh, but we did want to show what the potential might be for uh, locating something on the I-5 corridor. Um, the Tonino location was selected, obviously, because of the, uh, the planned developments around the Ag Park, uh, Ag Innovation Park that's been discussed in that region. Um, so we wanted to show what that might look like for Thurston County. Uh, and then the Yelm, McKenna thing is just a, you know, it's a very central point where our counties intersect and you have the bridge and things are, you know, inter-county uh, transit and, uh, and, um, and economics as well. I, I will say a couple things about the, the drive shed analysis and what it, what it indicates. For Pierce County, we had very poor participation out of King County. So our sites in Pierce County, we think, probably are not truly reflective of the potential demand there. Um, we focus most of our efforts in Pierce and Thurston counties. We know there's a lot of demand out of Lewis County uh, that we captured just a, a nugget of. We know there's a lot of demand from the peninsula and also from Mason County, uh, Grace Harbor County. We know it's there. Um, they tend not to be as large operators as we have in Lewis and Thurston and even Pierce, but it is there. And so um, I think that those drive shed analyses are great for what we were able to collect, but they don't capture all the demand that's out there. Uh, one one um, example I'll, I'll use of that is, if you look at the USDA census, the National Ag Statistics Survey, take all that data with a grain of salt, a very big grain of like Himalayan sea salt, because it's not 100% accurate all the time. But what you'll see in the Pierce County data from 2017, and we'll have a new survey out at the beginning of next year, um, it says we have like 1,400 livestock producers. Well, those are people that have filled out a Schedule F tax form with the IRS. They might have harvested one or two cattle for $1,500 and gotten the tax benefit as a farm. Those don't really drive this market. Now, they're the people that are impacted by so much demand that they can't get their animal processed, and so they get, you know, they get squeezed out. So there is demand there, and they are important. But when we think about what the real commercial growers are and the ones that are trying to uh, you know, make a living out of this, uh, those numbers can be misleading. So don't think that you know, Thurston County has the number of commercial livestock farms that the Ag Census says it does. But also don't think that it only has the limited number that the survey says that you do. Uh, what we really have value in this study is the direct feedback from the players in this industry. That's really what matters more than the hard numbers here. We know that, you know, this band of central Thurston County and into central and, well, into southern and central Pierce County is ripe for demand. Um, but trying to put a hard number on that, that's a feasibility study and that's a business plan kind of project. So that's out of our realm. Do we have commercial auction yards here locally? Yeah. There is one in Chehalis. Uh, Chehalis. It's in Lewis did County. You, did you find out from them where all their customers are coming from? Most of the customers at the one in Lewis County are coming from inside Lewis County and point south with a little bit moving from the north down. Um, an interesting thing about the Lewis County uh, livestock market, though, is we mentioned the need for more uh, infrastructure for hauling livestock. Um, you know, a lot of our farms are reliant on-farm slaughter because they don't have the equipment to move animals to different slaughter facilities. So they rely heavily on the WSDA mobile slaughtering units. 
that drive all over the place and are relatively inefficient because of these dispersed demand. Um, that's not a problem in Lewis County. There's lots of people hauling livestock in Lewis County. Um, and so there's there's something in there to, to learn. Uh, one of the things that we, we mentioned in the study is um, availability of livestock hauling equipment, you know, uh, like Pierce County's, uh, our conservation district has um, a tool library and they lease out uh, different pieces of equipment. And so that kind of concept of having a couple of animal haulers available so that farms could utilize them and potentially move them into these centralized slaughter hubs uh, to lessen the burden on the processors. And that was one thing that we tried to do as we talked through this study and the findings is we didn't want to be, it's, it's all you need to serve the farms or it's all you need to serve the processors. There are pieces on both sides of this sector that can benefit from efficiency gains. Thank you. Do you have an additional no, question? No. Commander? <clears throat> um, on, the, on the six locations, three, three in Thurston County, uh, Pierce County, and three, uh, I assume that it was not a priority across the region as to where will be the most feasible. We did not take into consideration what an individual farm would want the most. No. So um, in considering the demand that you stated um, didn't capture really King County because of the lack of participation. Somebody can assume that perhaps as you stated, the demand is higher than what we have in this report. Mm -hmm. So the question that I have is, um, based on what we know about the demand. It seems to me, looking at the report, and perhaps citing uh, one location in Thurston County meets the demand. And uh, perhaps if the demand is higher, will there be an opportunity to have two locations in the region? Is that a good assumption or? I think it's fair to assume at least one additional USDA location serving the region would be very valuable. I think we, we showed that with that 100 mile drive shed. That was what we really wanted to show with that map was there's this big hole in the middle, Lens Pierce County, Thurston County, Mason, some of Lewis, like there's a, there's a dearth of, of options. And especially if you factor in the peninsula, they are completely reliant essentially on either getting across to Island Grown Farmers, Farmers Cooperative up in Island uh, you know, near, um, uh, gosh, it's outside Mount Vernon, um, or driving all the way down and getting to Puget Sound Processing and Heritage Meats, um, which is fine. Uh, they do have Minder Meats up in Kitsap County, uh, which is an option, but they don't offer, and they don't do a lot of um, special packaging. It's, it's very much just like, this is what we do. <laughs> we take the carcass and we cut it up and out it goes. Um, so they don't get a lot of value add at that facility. Um, and it's, whenever we pick those locations, I think it's really important to point out, those six locations are not saying this should be a slaughter and processing facility. One of those could be a slaughter and processing facility and two or three of them could be these centralized hubs that provide just space for these activities to occur. Uh, in conversations with one of the largest mobile slaughtering businesses in the region, they're covering over 200 miles in a day. They're going from farm to farm, slaughtering two to three animals at a time. If they sat in one location, they can slaughter 15 to 20 cattle in a day. But instead, they're driving all over the place so they can slaughter five or six. Hmm. Okay, that, that's a gross inefficiency. Absolutely. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we really want to try to hone in on because we are all constrained by issues like gift of public funds and the ability to generate grants and, and loan programs and everything else. So trying to come up with these sort of, you know, touch points that connect these different entities, I think, has value. Uh, and again, it goes back to that scheduling and transparency, uh, the education and experience gap. All these things, they really start to tie together. Um, the last thing I'll say there to tie it together is some of our less experienced farms have had difficulty scheduling uh, with some of our slaughter and processing facilities. They don't, for lack of a better term, they're not really sure how to fit into the system as it is. And they don't have uh, as much clarity as to how to plan and schedule uh, their livestock. 
and how to move them through the system so that they're harvesting right at the prime time. And so they'll be overaged or underaged and the meat's not as high a quality um, or they're just taking whatever time they can get in a schedule. And that's, that was something that we viewed as problematic. So I have one last question. Oh, oh I have three more questions, four, I guess. That's so uh, in, in reality, it seems to me the, the true the next step will be, as you stated, the feasibility study. Yes, sir. They will give us really uh, type, size, and location. Yes, sir. Uh, because absent that, we're going to leave this, this study at the 30,000 foot level. And, you know, a heat map is not really something that we need to live with. So I think takes the next, taking the next step, feasibility study, type, size, and location is probably what truly the next step is. I, w I would confirm that, yes. That is correct. So, thank you. Do you suppose for, uh, I don't know what the term to use on, but like the carbon footprint business, is that a selling point to have a centrally located that might help us get money in a grant? I, I think that's a, that's a great concept, Commissioner. Uh, the idea of increased sustainability, increased efficiency, less, uh, you know, less pollution, <laughs> all that stuff ties in. Uh, there's certainly opportunities out there. There are um, all kinds of infrastructure grants uh, that are available right now, um, not just through USDA, but other services. So I, I think the sustainability tie-in is legitimate. Stephen, Aslan, questions? Can I just go really quick? I just it sounds like a feasibility study could be a next step or whatever. But just from the experience that you've already had leading up to this and this, like, do you have, I mean, are you allowed to say it out loud? Do you have recommendations? Is it those kind of, like, central places that a slaughter truck could pull in? If we had more of those just available around? I th I'll, be, I'll be careful how I answer that. I think there is an opportunity with that approach to get more immediate relief for folks relying on WSDA services. WSDA specific. So that would be the custom exempt. Piece. That would be the custom exempt. Um, that is a challenge. You could design those type of uh, satellite facilities for USDA slaughter. They just have to meet certain and specifications. They'd have to have inspectors and there'd need to be infrastructure and there'd need to be a way to But you could do mobile USDA slaughter at such a place. And then... The question that we were struggling with before this launch when we had our weekly meetings was, should we be helping the existing facilities increase their capacity versus trying to create new facilities? Do you, can you weigh in quickly on that? Yeah, I think there is room for both. Uh, the, the processing facilities definitely could take more. Uh, and it goes back to that cold storage cold issue. Storage issue. Um, and obviously, the, the local grants are not really as much of an option. But one thing that we've heard, not just in this study, but in lots of other work that we do around ag in Pierce County is, our farms need help writing grants. They need that kind of support, that sort of service. I know NABC was helping a couple. That, so. that is one option. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. thank you all for the opportunity. Yeah, I just got to Thank fly. you, awesome. Okay, Stephen? Um, there was mention of the existing processing facility, USDA, down in South Thurston County, taking in a lot of product from not only the counties and the catchment area that you worked on, but like even further. Yes. Did any more detail come out about the type of demand that a new facility would create from across multiple other counties and beyond that, which would then really further strengthen the case for one or however many more? Uh, the, the numbers are in the report and the appendices, but um, just about, I'd, I'd say it's something like 60 to 70% of the farms that participated said they want more access to USDA. Mm -hmm. So we're already at capacity at our facility in Southern Thurston County. They may increase just a little bit at their new location, but it would not be enough to meet the demand that's out there. Yeah. No, nothing at the moment. Well, I think my main question was around um, identifying capacity and that equilibrium that was talked about, knowing that there may be projects that um, have the potential to move forward that, uh, you know, is a feasibility study the next step or, you know, are we evaluating some of the other options, recognizing that we don't want to over flood the capacity? 
Well, thank you, Mike, for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Um, and this 402, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.